Okay. Well, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Welcome today. Um, and we'll open up with a uh, we'll open up with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you now that you have provided again another day, Lord, that uh, we can stop, reflect on the things of your word and your truth, uh, how it applies to our life, both at work, at home, and wherever we may be. Lord, we pray that you will take our hearts today, transform us to the image of your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, also, uh, we ran out of sandwiches. We got 60 today, and I didn't think we'd get 60, but apparently I was wrong, so <laughs> next time we'll order more. Now, these uh, these screens are out, as you can see right here, but uh, the two screens on the end are, uh, on, are on, and then uh, hopefully for those of you who are dialed in, you don't see me, but you see the slides. Am I correct? Hopefully. Okay, I'm guessing that's okay. So, um, a couple things before we get started. Um, first off, uh, is anybody in here who golfs? Uh, the chaplain has a team, myself and Chaplain Carson. We're looking for two more people. So, <laughs> if you golf, and we're really looking for it, doesn't matter if you golf good or not. But <laughs> if you're a linger, we really would like you on our team. We actually came in last place last year and won golf lessons, so it paid off. Uh, that's pretty good. Um, let me see what else. Oh, potluck. Okay, so next week. Uh, Raisha, right, right next week is the potluck. Yes. All right, so what, what Ms. Bennett's going to do is send out an electronic uh, sign-up sheet for that. Uh, we're going to try to go with a little Easter theme. And um, so that's next week. Potluck that turned out really well last time, and so we want to do that probably once a month. All right, is that that's about right, isn't it? Okay, so uh, hopefully you can see uh, one side or the other. Let's go ahead and get started with this. So last week... A little recap, we talked about covenants, and um, I, I said that the covenant is an unchangeable, divinely imposed legal agreement between God and man, or God and, God and mankind that stipulates the conditions of their relationship, and so remember I said it was God who dictated it, uh, because um, he's the one who knows the end from the beginning, the beginning from the end, he knows what's best for us, he has our best interest at heart, so he's telling us, this is how you approach me? And this is how you walk with me. Um, and so that's what a covenant. We talked about the different covenants, starting with the Abrahamic covenant. And there were three parts to that. Do you remember what those three parts were? A blessing, a, a, blessing, a, a seed, and then the land, right? So land, seed, and blessing. So that, that was the three parts. So then you had three sub-covenants, right? You had the uh, Palestinian covenant, which was the land part. So someday Israel will be there again. God said they would be there, and they will be there again someday in totality. Now, they're there right now in a little strip of land that's 140 miles long and 70 miles wide, but uh, if you look at uh, the Old Testament, it's really expanded. It goes all the way into Sinai and all the way east towards uh, Euphrates, so it's going to be huge. Uh, so that was their land. The, the, blessed, the seed was, of course, the seed through David. We talked about that would end up in the as Christ, as Jesus. And then uh, finally the blessing that uh, by faith through him, all nations of the earth will be blessed through him and his seed. And so it turns out that uh, it's not just the physical seed that are blessed, it's the, it's the spiritual seed, those who are of faith in Christ. And those are the children, the true children of Abraham. Um, so we talked about those. We talked about the Old and New Covenants in your scripture and your Bible, which we know as the Old and New Testaments, and we'll talk about that a little more today. And then finally, uh, we discussed Jacob. The name Jacob means deceiver, of course, and now you're starting to see he has now turned from a person who is trusting in his own worldly wisdom, his own scheming, his own uh, uh, trickery. And he's starting to trust in God a little bit more now. He's starting, and he's starting to see that God is sovereign among all things that happen in our life. And so we don't have to manipulate. We don't have to force things. We allow God to work in our life, and he'll do that. So Jacob is just starting to trust God. Um, now, a couple of scriptures here before we get started. The difference between the spirit and the flesh. So the Abrahamic covenant culminates 
um, at the, in the end time with Israel, of course, but in the inter intermediate time, there's this period of time we call, uh, some people call it the church age, or it's this uh, period in between, uh, you could call it the summer if you want to, uh, because uh, if you remember, Israel had seven feasts, there were four in the uh, fall, and then there were three, in, I'm sorry, there were four in the spring, and then there were three in the fall, and then the summer there wasn't anything going on, and we know that uh, four of those in prophecy have already taken place. We're waiting for the last three to start. So we're in that middle part between Israel, how God was dealing with them before, and how God will deal with them later. And that's in Romans 11, if you want to read. Uh, we're in the middle there. And what happened was Israel, according to chapter 11 of Romans, because of unbelief, God has now grafted Gentiles into that olive tree. And that's you and me. And, um, and so for a short time, he's dealing with the uh, Gentiles, with the church. But he, sometime in the future, he will deal with the, the Jews again. That's chapter 11 of Romans. Romans 9, 8 says, It's not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise who are regarded as descendants. John 3, 6, Jesus was talking to Nicodemus. He said, That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. In fact, that is the motif of uh, John all the way through that um, Jesus would tell them something. Uh, they, they, would, they wouldn't understand it on a spiritual level. Uh, they, they always thought of it on a physical level. If a man must be born again, how can a man be born again? How can he enter into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus said, that which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. The woman at the well, Jesus told her, I have water to give you that if you drink of it, you will never thirst again. Sir, give me this water. She was still thinking on a physical level he was talking about spiritual uh, blessing and then when 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 uh, Jesus was offering himself to the people in John chapter 6 he says unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood you will have no part in me but John 6 35 uh, Jesus says that um, it is uh, the flesh profits nothing it is the spirit that gives life and so he said he that cometh to me shall never hunger he that believes on me shall never thirst so you see, he wasn't talking about a physical eating his body. He was talking about a spiritual taking part of him. So all through John, you have this motif of the flesh versus the spirit. And the, it, the Jews were stuck on the flesh. Jesus was trying to get them into the spirit. In fact, that's what the word parable means. You ever heard the word parable? In Greek, it means cast alongside. Because what happened is Jesus would tell a story, a physical story, and then right after that, he'd make a spiritual application. You see, and so that's what that way you can farming. You talk about farming, you talk about military, you talk about all kinds of stuff that we know happens. Now we can carry it over to the spiritual realm. So that, so again, flesh and spirit here. Galatians three seven. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. Okay? So it's not. This is the new covenant we're talking about here. And then finally, in Deuteronomy thirty two. God said, they have made me jealous with what is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous with those who are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. And that foolish nation is you and me. So we are now brought in as children of Abraham um, because of their unbelief. But we're grafted in. You see how this works. And so... Um, that, this is the new covenant, which we will talk about right now, walking in the Spirit. And Jeremiah 31, 31. Let me turn there. Now, we talked about this last week. I wanted to spend a little more time on this so you understand the importance of this new covenant. Let's talk about the covenants again. So you have uh, some scholars, they go so far as the uh, eternal covenant. That's the covenant between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Where that, uh, And this is a good way to remember it. The Father thought it. Uh, the son bought it, and the spirit wrought it. So the, it, it's, it's, you know, it's fairly a good way to think about it. The father thought it up. The son was the one who actually made the purchase with his body. And then uh, finally the spirit is the one who works it out in you. And so there's an eternal covenant between the Trinity. And then you have the, uh, there's a, uh, what we call the Edenic, Edenic covenant, the covenant in Eden. And then there's a Noahic covenant with Noah, but... Those are not so well known. But then you have the Abrahamic covenant, the one we're talking about, that God makes with Abraham, a land, a seed, and a blessing. So in Jeremiah 31, 
Oh, let me stop there. Stop there. Now, in these covenants, you also have another covenant called the Mosaic Covenant. Okay? That is basically the law. The Ten Commandments, the 613 laws, and uh, the Pentateuch. Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible. There's 613 thou shalt nots and thou shalt in those five books. 365 of them are negative and the rest are positive. And so this is the Mosaic Covenant where God says, if you do this, I will bless you. This was a conditional covenant. Uh, it was a bilateral covenant that if uh, God will do this, but they have something to do too, you see. And, and if God, they will do that, then God's going to take his hand from them and remove his blessing. The Abrahamic Covenant is a unilateral covenant. It was an unconditional covenant. God said, I will do this. It wasn't dependent on what Abraham did. It was, it was all dependent on what God did. So these are two different covenants. And so the Abrahamic covenant was a covenant of grace. All through, this grace just carried all through the Old Testament into the New Testament, you see. And uh, it's God's promise, I will do this. The Mosaic covenant was a covenant of works. And it was, again, it was a conditional covenant. So that what it was was that... Um, he, the law was put there for a few reasons. Number one, it was to demonstrate that we cannot keep the law. In fact, I like asking people every now and then, I, uh, you know, do you think you're going to go to heaven or where do you think you're going to go when you die? Well, I think I'll go to heaven. What makes you think you'll go to heaven? Because I follow the Ten Commandments. And of course, my next question is, can you name them? Because it would seem to me, if you're basing your eternity on ten laws, <laughs> you'd like to know what they are, right? Um, very few people can, can name them. The commandments were given uh, for a couple reasons to indicate the, God's morality. This is where God's standard is. In case you didn't know, this is my standard. And so, and Paul said, in fact, Paul said, I would not have known it was wrong to covet unless the law says thou shalt not covet. That's the tenth commandment. I think God put that in there. That's a catch all covenant because everyone's broken that one. You may not have broken the other nine, but you definitely coveted something somewhere in your life. And so those laws were meant to show the mor God's moral character, but they were also to demonstrate to us, we can't keep them. And we, there needs to be something else that we need here. And so God's showing us that, that uh, in fact, the, the word sin is hemartia in Greek. It means to miss the mark. And so like you're, you're at a rifle range or whatever, you're shooting and you're missing bullseye, that's sin. You're missing the mark. And so what the sin, what the commandments show us is that we miss the mark. We cannot keep them, no matter what. And we need, there needs to be another way. And so God says, uh, I provided another way, and it's a new covenant. I want you to know about it. So in Jeremiah 31, Jeremiah tells us, uh, let me read this here. Jeremiah 31. 31, 31, I think it is. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand, lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after these days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. It, he's good. It's not going to be external anymore. It's going to be internal. And it's going to be here. That's where the new covenant's going to be. And so it's no longer external conformity to the law, but it's an internal walk with the Spirit. That's what he's talking about here. And so in the Old Testament, so you've got this covenant, you have the Mosaic, you've got the Abrahamic, the covenant of grace carries over. But then if you notice, uh, what happens in the New Testament is Jesus said, he came not to destroy the law, but to what? No, to fulfill it. He was the only one who has ever um, fulfilled the law completely. Every commandment, all 613, all of them, he's the only one that's ever done that before. And he's, here's what he says in 2 Corinthians 5.21. If you give me your sin, I will give you my righteousness. That's, that's basically the gospel right there. Uh, he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's 2 Corinthians 5.21. That's called a double imputation. Yes. All it is, is, is 
God is saying, I will, if you trust me on this, if you ask me, I will transfer your sins, the part where you couldn't keep the law, I will transfer that over to my son, and I will take his righteousness and give it to you. Now, to me, that's a pretty good trade. When I'm through. Right. I mean, really, it is. Yeah. And so that's, that's what basically the gospel is all about, just to, taking his righteousness, he's taking your sin. So Jesus in the New Testament in uh, Luke 22, 20, let's turn there. Luke 22, 20, now Jesus, this is at the Passover meal. And um, remember what John said about Jesus in John 1, 29, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. So in, in the Gospels, Jesus was a, a lamb. But when, you, when you look at Revelation, he's a what? He's a lion. It's a little bit different. He's coming in all his glory. That's right. He's going to be a different Jesus <laughs> than the movies portray him as. I'm, I'm serious about that. Yeah, it's going to be something. He's going to be, it says he's going to be leading an army. That's right. And there's going to be a bloodbath. Mm -hmm. But now then, uh, Luke 22, uh, what verse did I say? 20. 20. Yeah. 20. Like, likewise, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. And so here Christ, he's, he's basically saying, I am about to establish a new covenant, but before I do that, I have to die. Something has to die here. Something has to shed blood, and that's going to be me. I am, and this cup signifies that. I'm going to be the new covenant. Um, and I'm going to establish and bring in the new covenant here. So up until Christ, everyone was practicing the law, and that's the way it was supposed to be. But after him, there was something new that happened. The Spirit came and uh, now indwells us. Because in the Old Testament, if you remember, the Spirit would come and go. Right. Yeah. right? That's why Paul, David said, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Yeah. Remember that? And uh, the Spirit would come and go for special reasons, like for Samson to give him strength, or, or Saul or David. Sometimes the Spirit would come on him. But in the New Covenant, the Spirit comes and stays. It dwells. And it dwells, and you are sealed by the Spirit of God, Ephesians 4.30 says, I believe. Let's go on with it. So, now what happened? Here's what happened. So you got this new covenant. Every writer in the New Testament, except with possible exception of Luke, was a Jew. All the first Christians were Jews. All of them were, except there was a couple of Gentiles, but most mostly Jews. But there were some Jews that we call Judaizers who would say, they would come around to churches after Paul left and would say, you know, that's good that you're trusting in this Messiah, but you know you have to practice the law of Moses in order to maintain this. You have to get circumcised. He was actually telling, they were telling Gentiles you had to be circumcised and follow the law of Moses. So in Acts 15, if you read there, there was a Jerusalem council. council. This is in 48 AD or 49 AD. After Paul's first um, missionary <coughs> journey, his first missionary journey uh, was uh, 47 to 49 and it was about 1,400 miles he walked. Um, but right after he came back, he found out these Jews were going around telling, or these, these Jewish Christians were going around telling these new Christians, these Gentiles, they had to practice the law of Moses. So they had to come up with a council. This was the first problem in the church. Uh, legalism. It was the first problem in the church. That and, and uh, if I got, and by the way, Galatians was, uh, in my opinion, was the first book written by Paul, and that was after his first missionary journey. Uh, and then after his second mission, missionary journey, I think he wrote First and Second Thessalonians. The problem there was that people were thinking Jesus was coming back immediately, so they were quitting their jobs, and they were just waiting for, for him to translate them. And that's why Paul said, hey, you get, if anybody would not work, they should not eat. Now get, get back to work, you know. Um, and then the third missionary journey after that, when he wrote uh, Romans and First and Second Corinthians, and, of course, when he was in prison, he wrote his other four. Uh, I'm not going to get into that right now. So so they're going back to the old. You see, why do they go back to Left to our own devices, humans always love to go to something that's physical, something kind of checklist, something they can check off. Because grace doesn't make sense to us. We can't measure grace. And you can't compare grace. We love to compare. We love to count. We love to manipulate. And, and to show, I got... I got more than you do. I've done more than you. I must be better than you. And so that's just, so left to our own devices, we always go back to this. Paul had to encourage us. Why are you doing that? He, in fact, in Galatians 2, Paul says, listen to this. 
uh, he wrote, he just got through seeing them, and he, he came back and he found out what they were doing, and he wrote a letter that said, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Listen, I see, I see churches do this all the time. They will preach salvation by grace. Mm -hmm. But then when it comes to, to the Christian life, they go back to law. Amen. This is, uh, this is what you, here's the do's and don'ts. Here's what you have to do and don't. People love that. In fact, preachers uh, do it because people like to hear it. I got us. In fact, if you want to write a book and it be a bestseller, entitle it Three Steps to Spirituality. Like people, <laughs> people like this checklist, this steps thing. Like that. They love it. And so a lot of churches, what they'll do is they'll say, okay, I'm, yeah, you were saved by grace, but now you've got to follow this pattern in order to grow. My, my contention is that how you started, that's how you should finish. It's that's by right. grace. It's by the Spirit of God. And it's by walking in the Spirit. Um, the method of justification ultimately determines the method of sanctification. Sure. So uh, just to get my terms straight here, just so you understand where I'm coming from. Justification is, um, is being declared righteous. Remember when I told you the double imputation thing? Okay, so you take on Jesus' righteousness. Now God declares you righteous. Right, that's one thing. Sanctification is growing in him and walking in him. So that's the twofold thing we're talking about, coming to God and walking with him. And so people think, okay, when it comes to sanctification, we'll do it different. No, it's the same thing Paul is saying. It's by grace. Amen. You grow by grace. And just because someone's growing has more than you or, or seems to uh, uh, grow faster, you, know, you don't compare yourselves with other people. It's between you and the Lord how you do this. And really, in fact, when Jesus, remember at the end of the book of John, uh, it was Jesus, John, and Peter. And, and Jesus told Peter, hey, follow me. I want you, I want you to go with me. And then Peter said, what? What about this guy? And Jesus said, don't worry about him. That's right. I, t I told you to, don't worry about him. I told you to follow me. So don't compare yourself. You don't have to manipulate or count. It's all by grace. Colossians 2.6 says, therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. Now you get, you get my point here? As you walk in him, it's all by grace and by his spirit. Walking in the spirit. The spiritual life is a balance between the twin extremes of legalism and license. Yes. All right. So legalism. Legalism is what we're talking about with the Judaizers here. They were they were told to go back to the law. I know that I know that you've accepted Christ, you're the Messiah, but you need to go back to the law to grow. Uh, and and the thing about law and is that uh, some pastors can actually have some major influence over you and really put a guilt trip on you if they wanted to, if they knew how to do it. it had some power thing. You, got, you have to do this, you have to read this, or whatever, and, and it's really the wrong thing to do. In fact, Jeremiah 23, 1 says, uh, if God says, uh, destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. Woe unto the pastors. That destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. Jeremiah 23 1. Jeremiah 23 1. Mm -hmm. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. I never want to be in that group. Uh, I want to be in a group that encourages you to grow in a spirit, then not go back to legalism or law. So legalism has to do with a set of standards of formality. License, on the other hand, has to do with. Uh, Having no, it's antinomian is, is another word. It's no law. Antinomian means no law in, in uh, Greek or life. On the table, not here. Anyway, um, so you have you have the the extremes of legalism and uh, license, and in the middle is liberty. It's little. See what Paul did was uh, when he wrote Romans. How much time do I have? I'll tell you this. Yeah, I got time. Well, Paul wrote Romans. The first four uh, sections of that is basically chapters one. It goes like this. 
God's position, our condition, uh, God's provision, our decision. So the first two chapters is God's position. That's his position, what we, he says we are. Chapter 3 is our condition as sinners. Chapters 4 and 5, uh, uh, Paul talks about God's provision, which is faith, salvation by faith. And then chapter 6 through 8 is our decision. We have a decision now we can walk. We have decisions and choices now that you never had before because now you can walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. So uh, so what Paul would do as he's writing, he has this in, imaginary interlocutor, this, this person that uh, kind of like with me and my wife sometimes, uh, I'll get upset with her and then I'll have an argument with her in my mind. I, I already know what she's going to say. I, yeah, am I the only one that does that, guys? I know what she's going to say, and I already have a response for her, right? Uh, which, is bad, which is a bad thing to do. That's mind reading, and I don't do that anymore, by the way, sweetheart. <laughs> Paul would do the same thing when he's writing his letters. He would have this person, so he would write chapter 5. He would compare the lesser to the greater, which was, a, was something that Jews did. They, uh, Jewish uh, rabbis, they would say, well, Adam did this, but Christ did this. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That's Romans 5.20. Mm -hmm. And so it's always the lesser to the greater. He assumed the person's going to say, really? Well, I guess then I guess then we should sin more so that more grace will come down. No. So in chapter 6, he even says that. He says, I know what you're going to say. And let me say, no, that is not what I'm saying. In fact, if you are it's truly, if you are truly a believer, that kind of that kind of behavior will breathe the Holy Spirit of God in your heart, and you and you will be miserable actually. Um, and so he's saying no. That's, so that's license. License is when you take it. Hey, there's no law I can do whatever I want to. Um, God's going to forgive me. That's the other end of the spectrum. What Paul is encouraging here is a balance between the two, and that's liberty. liberty. So you're not tied to law anymore. Other, uh, I've heard going on this before. I told you about Jesus. I told you about the 360. I mean, the 613 commandments, right? Mm -hmm. And then if you if you take all those and condense them down into 10 commandments, they would be the 10 commandments. And if you take all those and condense them down to two commandments, what would they be? Love God. I love you. And who said that in the New Testament? Jesus. Jesus. So basically, Jesus was saying. So you see, I want you to follow me here. The law of Moses is still there, but he's saying now, just love God and love your neighbor. Amen. And if you do that, you'll be fulfilling the entire law. Amen. That's, you see, that's what he's saying. And so what Paul is saying is that if you're truly doing those two things, you will neither be on the one end of, of license, of, uh, of doing whatever you want to because you're already going to heaven, or legalism, doing it because you can compare yourself with others, but you're doing it because you love God and love your neighbor. So, um, that was that. How much time? What time? You got three minutes. Oh, I got three minutes. Good. So, now, this is what I wanted to talk about last time, and I'll finish on this. Wasting time with God. And so, I think I'll, I'll finish this. Last time I, I left on this, wasting time with God, that most people believe I don't know how to tie in this to what I just said, so I'm trying to think of a segue here. Uh, so as you're walking in the Spirit, yeah, here's a good way. As you're walking, and uh, let me say a little caveat here. The best way to walk in the Spirit is, is to abide in Him. Yes. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. John 15, 7 or 8, somewhere around there. Abiding in Him is simply practicing the spiritual disciplines of Spending time with him, carving time out for him. Because remember what I said before, you will never find time for God. You have to make time for him. Carving time, like you're doing right now, like we're doing. And spending time with him, meditating on his word, and praying to him. And allowing him to fill you with his, his uh, as Paul says, enlighten, lighten the eyes of our understanding. Fill us, fill us with his love and his power. And then we can produce fruit, which glorifies him. It, goes, it all goes back to him. So the very first time, if you're a morning person, or if you do your devotions in the morning, most people in the world will tell you, that's a waste of time. You, sh you should get, get going with life, get going with work, check the internet, check the stocks. I'm telling you right now, 
the most important part of your day is the time you spend with him. Yes. I'm saying, I'm saying that's the most important part of your day. It really is. You will find this out, and you stop. He, he will give you a sense of peace that comes that the world cannot give you, and it passes all understanding. And understand, and so um, that, in my opinion, to see the, the economy of this world is not the economy of heaven, and so that kind of stuff. What I'm talking about here, spending time with God, doesn't work well in this world system, because the world's telling you to be busy and to get on it, but God's telling you to wait on me. But those that wait upon the Lord shall, shall renew their strength. strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. That's Isaiah 40, 31. So, and then finally, what did I, oh, yeah, I'm going to wait and show you this um, Tate Weaver fight whenever I have these screens, because you got to see. Anybody know about the Tate Weaver fight? Raise your hand. Okay, um, I don't know. Can you, can you see those down there? The Tate Weaver, I'll, I'll finish with this. Yeah, Tate Weaver fight. Um, Tate Weaver, this was back in, I, don't, I forgot, was it 83 or somewhere, but uh, Tate was in the, uh, let me see if he's in the white trunks. This is a 15-round heavyweight fight. And, uh, oh, here we go. So Weaver's in the, uh, in the red trunks. Tate's in the white. Yes, it's 1980. And this is 15th round. Tate has be beat Weaver every round. Those of you who know about boxing, it's, it's, it's um, scored every round. Tate has beat him every round. And uh, this is the end of the 15th round. Tate has a 25 pound edge, though, and that makes a difference when you get into a situation like this where everybody's flailing away or where the other man is desperate. Got that much of an edge, you can climb up. I see some blood on the shoulder. Tate, that's got to be coming from somewhere. So far, I haven't exactly seen where. There's a overhead right high on the side of Tate's head by Weaver. I guess Mike Snow's bleeding a little bit. Maybe what it is. Weaver. <laughs> Less than one minute to go in the round, he gets knocked out. Folks, that is the spiritual life. It, it doesn't look like you're winning a lot of times yeah. on earth. But I'm going to tell you right now, I, I've read I've read the end of the book. <laughs> you actually win. In That's the end. right. And it's going to be a knockout. And um, and so I want you to remember that, okay, as you go throughout the day. Um, be an influence where you are. Love God. Love your neighbor. And uh, any, any comments, questions? Let's see. I think uh, next week we'll be doing here. Yeah, so don't forget about the uh, the potluck, right? Yeah. Let me get that. Okay, don't forget about the potluck. And uh, we'll meet on the next week. For that. All right, let's, let's pray. Lord, thank you now that you have shown us, Lord, your word that it's by your grace, not only that we come to you, but also that we walk with you. Help us to practice that grace in our life on a daily basis, looking unto you as the author and finisher of our faith, and trusting, Lord, that you will protect and provide everything we need to do your will. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.